Welcome to the regular business meeting of the Committee on Kids Practice. We are starting at 4.36. We have a quorum. Um, we don't have a Committee on Kids Practice meeting. Please, please, for you to have her. Okay, we have a few of us. We need a vote to um, allow Commissioner Eddie to get the first relief. He does not get the quorum. Thank you. Second. Okay. okay. In favor? Does that need to go in? Opposed? Yeah. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Edwards can join us virtually. So, thank you. All right. So, we'll move on to the roll call. That's okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can barely hear myself. Okay. Um, all right. Let me go ahead and start. So, Chair Tran. Thank you. Uh, first Vice Chair Dennis Brown. Here. Chair Case. Here. Uh, Octavio Aguilar. Layla Aziz is present. Thank you. Bonnie Benitez. Here. Alec Byer. Here. Thank you. Cheryl Canson. Thank you. Christina Griffin Jones is absent. Okay. Lupe Diaz is not here. Dwayne Harvey is not here. Brendan Hilbert. Here. Thank you. James Justice. Here. Thank you. Darlene Walnut is excused. Clovis Honore is excused. Thank you. And Ivania Rubio is absent. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I also make note uh, uh, for staff that's here as well, and just for the public to know? So we have our interim executive director, <clears throat> sorry, Danelle Scarborough. We have our community engagement coordinator, Yasmin Obid. We have chief investigator, uh, Olga Golub, and um, John A. McFarland, sorry, our <laughs> administrative um, assistant, and then myself, Alina Conde, executive. Assistant, and then also just to make note at 437, Lupe is here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Condi. All right, so we're moving on to the approval of the meeting minutes. Does anyone have any changes to, to propose for the meeting minutes that were sent out? A second. Uh, Commissioner Byer, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, Commissioner Diaz? Larkin and Canton, are you okay with the meeting minutes? Okay, so it's you now. Thank you. All right, so moving on to non agenda public comments. Um, Ms. OB, and just a reminder that only one mic can be on at a time, so when you're not speaking, please turn off your mic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do you want to announce it? You want to announce that he's here? We, can I can all hear me, please. Yes. A reminder for the public: we will be uh, taking non-agenda public comment right now. So, if you have any public comment on agenda items, please hold those. We have no in-person non-agenda public comment. I'll move on to the virtual queue. If you are here to speak on a non-agenda um, item, please um, raise your hand now. We have four people in the queue. I'll go ahead and start with Layla O. You have 90 seconds. Hi there, um, my name is Lily. I am a uh, Jewish San Diegan and um, I am here to oppose in the strongest terms any training conducted by the Commission on Police Practices that includes the Anti-Defamation League the ADL is not a friend to the Jewish community or any of our communities. Sorry, it is Lily, group. I interrupt you. This, we're now on agenda public comment. Please turn um, this item is on the agenda. If you can please hold your comment to um, under ad health committee report under training committee. Thank you. Again, if you are um, if you're here to speak on non agenda public comment, please keep your hand raised. Otherwise, please put your hand down. I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, 
allow a thought to speak. All right. Yes. And how long do I have? Uh, maybe said um, to speak or not. I just comment. Okay. Uh, I'll start now. The commission on, well, I'm Ethel Swede, a Jewish member of Jewish Voice for Peace living in La Jolla. The commission on police practices should not invite the ADL to participate in a training session on hate crimes and anti-Semitism. Our country prides itself on equal. Oh, um, apologies, Ethel. I muted you. Um, what you're on the agenda? It is under agenda item. Um, uh, the ad hoc committee report. So please hold your comments till then. Seven B. Thank you. All right. Um. I believe this concludes non agenda public comment. I may see um, hands for folks who are ready to vote. Thank you. And I just wanted to make note, I'm so sorry. I wanted to make note that Commissioner um, Octavio Aguilar and Dwayne Harvey are here now. Thank you. Thank you. Is that working? Thank you, Ms. Condi and Ms. Obi. Um, now we move on to the cabinet report. All right, so we are excited to welcome four new commissioner candidates appointed to the Commission on Police Practices on Monday by the City Council. Uh, we have Council District 6 Representative Stephen Chatsky, forgive me if I mispronounce names, Council District 9 Representative Armando Flores, at large representative Ada Liz Rodriguez, and at large representative John Arma, Arma Trout. So we welcome them. They, they need to go through background checks and take the oath of office prior to officially joining the CPP, which should only take about two weeks. We hope to have we hope to have them at our next meeting as full commissioners, um, and then we will talk about the training process. The nomination deadline for the low to moderate seat vacated by Commissioner Nicole Murray Ramirez is February second. The City Council will fill that seat in the near future. I have a couple of resignations to announce due to time, commitment, Commissioners Jamie Sanchez, Dahlia Gila, and Mark Maddox have resigned. Uh, Jaylene and Dahlia filled the youth seat, and Mark filled a low to moderate income seat. All of them shared that their schedules made it difficult to attend meetings and be active with the CPP. We thank them for their time with the commission. And we have notified the uh, city council president's office so they can open, open nominations for those people. All right, moving. Yes, sir. Of the ones who resigned. Okay, Commissioner Jaylee Sanchez, Dahlia Villa, and Mark Matt. Okay. Uh, the cabinet and the interim executive director Scarborough met with Mayor Todd Gloria on January 24th. Uh, we updated him on the CCP accomplishments. We let him know that we are in a foundation building period and reinforce the importance of the police chief who is community oriented and open to CPP inputs. Uh, we thought it was a really good meeting. He was extremely down to earth. He did have to interrupt us for a meet for a call from the vice president uh, because, it, <laughs> because it was uh, due to FEMA and FEMA um, funding for the flood. Some areas. So we are glad that that's true. We also met with Chief Nislight on January 30th. We discussed the inappropriateness of mentioning a commissioner name to the cadets during the account tour. The agreement was inappropriate and asked the IA Captain Peterson to contact the training Captain Morris to ensure that that was not happening yet. So we appreciate uh, Commissioner Harvey bringing that to our attention. We updated him on the outside investigator who will review by our cases. We'll hear more about from outside investigator, <laughs> um, Golu. We also shared with him our goal to review cases within nine months rather than a year. The reason is to potentially affect the discipline for sustained findings against officers since IA issues discipline no later than 10 months after a complaint is filed to ensure they don't allow a case to expire. So when the CPP can review cases within nine months, 
that gives us a month to get our recommendation to IA and work more closely with IA regarding uh, discipline. And they seem very open to that and very positive about that goal. Unfortunately, the CPP retreat that was scheduled for January 27 had to be canceled due to lack of forum. We thank the commissioners who showed up, as well as the staff for their hard work in preparation and setup. We ask that if you respond that you could attend the meeting and something comes up which you completely understand, um, please let staff know so as soon as possible. It takes a lot to set up meetings and we can avoid that if we can learn at a time. And we also offer recommendations. This is not completely related, but two of our commissioners were extremely um, involved in helping flood victims. So Commissioner Harvey and Commissioner Canson were extremely helpful working in the community for days, helping flood victims. Thank you. And, oh, thank you. And Commissioner Aziz, thank you. Sorry? Oh, thank you. wow. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we will attempt to reschedule our retreat because we still think it's important once we find a date where, has, where we can have a forum and also bring new commissioners on board. So that's going to be a positive. But um, it's high on our priority. All right, because we couldn't discuss CPP business at the Campbell retreat, we can share with each other a little bit more about our lives. We can be okay. Uh, so um, the cabinet is addressing commissioner priorities based on feedback from the commissioner about the poll that was sent out, community, and the cases we reviewed. What we're working towards is the goal to address one public issue at the first meeting of each month. So we'll structure the meeting so that the closed session will be at the start of the meeting, then we'll have a public um, forum, we'll end the business meeting, and hold a public hearing. We're, we're looking at having our first one on January, March 6th, and we'll address the complaint received regarding the police pursuit policy. This comes on the heels of the police pursuit that ended in a crash that killed two little boys in early December. Community members, please put this on your calendar. That's March 6th. It, here in this building in uh, Balboa Park, we will also have our community outreach and our interim executive director work to share with the community. We hope to have the police here to share their policy on what their, uh, their policy is regarding public persons. So for the policy, the commission approved to hold forums for within the first six months of 2024, those are pretext stop, fourth waivers, the special operations unit, and de-escalation. What we will do is present a draft calendar to the commission at our next meeting of when we will hold those meetings. So you all can have input and hopefully really mark those uh, meetings on your calendars. Once the commission decides on those calendar dates, we'll put it out to the public so they all know what we're going to address at which meeting. And maybe we can put a flyer together or something to that effect. We have to figure out the marketing, but um, Ms. Hobie and, and Dr. Starber will be heavily involved in that. All right, thank you for those. And now our interim executive director, Dr. Danielle Starber, has a couple of special recognition. John A., can you join me up here, please? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure to be able to acknowledge city service. It's not loud enough. Yeah. Oh, I'll it's okay. Closer. We are celebrating Janae's 10 years <laughs> of city service. She started off <laughs> She started off as a, as a rec oh. center um, leader, and she developed and delivered a uh, cooking class. I asked her what her favorite parts of that early service was, and it was being a team member with the, well, at the Hilltop Recreation Center. And uh, that cooking pot that she developed and delivered still is in existence and continuing today. Then she promoted to assistant center director and moved around to a lot of the recreation centers. And her favorite part of that was developing the young rec she used to be and encouraging them to develop their programs and grow. And um, then she took a turn and um, left the Park and Recreation Department and joined the Commission on 
practices. And she was soaking up and learning every bit of the policy procedures and helping with all of that. So thank you for your city service and for being with the commission. <laughs> and then I'll continue with just a, a brief um, acknowledgement of the celebration that we had for Charmaine Mosley. Uh, the city council, um, both the chief of president oh. and the mayor, claimed Charmaine Mosley Day in the city of San Diego. So yesterday morning, we were in council and uh, watched that recognition happen. The members took the time to um, say specific words of appreciation to her name and invited her to speak about her eight years. Um, and as the um, former, um, the community board, the Citizens Review Board and Community Review Board on big practices and then helping get the transition to the Commission on Peace Practices. We had a little luncheon afterwards, it was delightful. I want to thank uh, Commissioner, uh, Secretary Vice Chair Doug Tate for the comments that we made in council chambers, thanking her for the work that she did um, over the eight years that she was here and to the commissioners and staff who were able to participate in celebrating her name. She has a huge job in um, Los Angeles now, we wish her a lot of luck in bringing that same professionalism that she shared with San Diego to the job of oversight of the counties of Los Angeles. So thank you for Thank you, Dr. Scarborough. Um, and thank you to Fermi for all she did in the transition and prior to that. All right, so now we move to the ad hoc committee reports. So, um, as mentioned, we had a last minute resignation from um, Chair Maddox, but I am pleased to announce that um, Commissioner Beyer and Commissioner Benitez have agreed to co chair the bylaws committee. It was close, it was the bylaws were drafted, and we had gotten to the point where if you had any suggested changes, please email um, Commissioner Maddox. I'm asking you if you email him any, re-email it to Commissioner Benitez and Commissioner Byer. Don't email a lot of people because we don't want a quorum, and now there's less for a quorum. Um, I know I emailed some changes. I'll be emailing those to you within the next day or two. We will hope to have an updated uh, draft bylaws by the next. There weren't that many changes from what I understand. Do you have anything to add? Okay, thank you for taking on that role. I really appreciate it. All right, so now we have the ad hoc training committee, and I turn it over to co-chair Hilford, who will give us a briefing, and then we will have public talk. Thank you. Okay, um, one other housekeeping note, uh, the training we've done are the use of our, of our draft training policy. So last meeting, we brought forward the onboarding piece. Um, again, one of the ideas is we want to bring this forward before commission so people can absorb it, take some thought, some time to think about it, and come back with feedback. We're going to be doing the same thing for the one we've done today as well. Uh, and then the housekeeping item is since we've done those two things, now we're going to wait for feedback. Plus, if you both care, we're going to be out of town for about a month. We're taking a hiatus for meetings until the 11th of March. Um, but we'll be sending those out in So, without further ado, uh, the training academy piece of page review. Um, this is just a discussion item. Uh, this is draft, so nothing is set in stone. The idea here is that we want to get feedback from both the community and the board by the commission. Um, we've tried to think right about roughly what we think is the most logical format to do uh, to do the training. Again, the idea for page review is for all commissioners, uh, so we want to get here and we want to come on board. It's important to make sure that they have an understanding of what policy procedures are from not just the NDA police department, but also what some of the best practices are across the country. Um, on top of that, we want to try to get some outside feedback. So that's kind of the best practice you'll see about the document. The idea there is we're going to try to get information from uh, NAPOL, from some other organizations that do oversight throughout the country. Uh, and then there's also some training that we'll be getting 
that uh, from the, the police department. So um, speak up, let me know. Um, and again, the idea here is nothing is going to be said. So we're trying to feedback, we're going out of ideas. After we get that feedback both from the commission and also from the community, then we start finalizing this to start the event. We want to kind of create an upgrade to be a component. So the third piece, um, and, and some of this kind of goes a little bit, a little bit repetitive to some of the stuff we have for the onboarding uh, side. Uh, but we, the first thing we have is um, an SCP overview that we pull in for the commissioners. I mean, obviously, we're also going to try to make sure that these are as open to the public as well. Uh, we're going to be private authorities and all these stuff online. But we think it's important uh, for everyone to understand kind of how OPD works and how it's structured and how it operates. Uh, the second we have on there is a ride along opportunity. We've heard feedback both pro and con, so we want to open it up to have feedback. I think it's probably helpful for people to consider doing that as one. Um, but I, that's also part of the bylaws, so we're going to have some of the rules of what we do and what we don't do. Um, so we put it down here, but that's also a discussion I didn't to talk about. Uh, and point two is kind of the, the new support of best practices. <clears throat> Again, the idea here is um, not getting at the record of the city of police department. This one we are proposing in April. Um, and then from there, we can figure out from what the best practices are and why, what is the PD doing? And do we think that's you know, the smart thing for us to do during San Diego? Or then it helps give us some, some more to do as well. Um, second to be, we can work these out of what we think are the four province areas. So this one is that we offer them all shootings and custody deaths. So with our new uh, charter amendment, we are required to do that patients on custody deaths and offer them all shootings. So uh, kind of the whole process of how that works for both major um, incidents and investigations and responses. Uh, the second one after that is C, uh, that's the use of force. The idea here is obviously uh, that's one of the big things we complain about. Complaint. So we want to know if the guidelines and procedures are for both lethal or if you use firearms and less lethal. So that would be things like you know, canine, behaviors, bean bags, etc. And then we propose uh, after that doing um based on our legal counsel who are legal perspectives uh for your support. Uh, another section that we get again, we're oftentimes kind of sparked up by what we get complaints on. So section 3A is procedure. Uh, we want to go over the case law and bring stops, detention, search, seizure, and arrest, and the rights that are uh, given to uh, detainees and arrested individuals. We're proposing that that would be thought by our legal counsel. Now, currently, that would be our outside counsel, our on-site counsel, our in-house counsel, uh, to be done by them. Section 3B, continuation of the search and seizure, that's one of the uh, case law we should be uh, confronting vehicles about. So, one of the things that we then see are um, searches or at down with vehicles. Uh, we see kind of a three more thing, but it's case law concerning entry uh, property. So when uh, people can get a door to that, for example. Um, 3D, that'd be uh, stops, pat downs, uh, detention, and handcuffing. Again, that would also be proper outside counsel. Section four um, would be step in the criminal justice process. So oftentimes, when we see complaints, um, it's not just what happens out in the field, but it's also what happens as people um, are detained and are taken down to the South Court, to the public headquarters, and then eventually they're transported to jail. That whole process is, I think, important for everyone to see the flow of courts. Um, one day to jail, our oversight of that is going to stop, but it's just kind of end up there and support what it is. Section 5A, uh, best practices and resources dealing with. Uh, mentally ill individuals and people that are under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Um, we're proposing various you know, mental health subject matter experts from the community. So, some of the ones we get proposed were um, the San Diego County Mental Health. And then, Fox um, Hurt is kind of working with half the old commission board, and also uh, Monty, which is the National Alliance for Mental Health. Um, after that, we wanted to do uh, something kind of the same thing, but how SCP do that. So, kind of what they're training on when it comes to um, you know, mentally ill individuals or people that are under the influence. Uh, going on down to A, again, uh, I know we have some public comment on this. Um, again, I want to reiterate that the list of what we have presenters, which is not final, we get more open up and get um, comments and feedback so we can consider things. But um, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, 
for Crawford, but this one is specific about uh, cultural awareness, understanding of the risk of the community. Um, obviously, there are communities that are the police, and so we want to have that perspective as well. And then following that, have the community come and show what they're saying on how they do the right thing. Section seven, uh, we've done this already for our current group, but it's very cool profiling by law enforcement. And we kind of just say, we've come in and get a presentation on that. So we'll potentially have an end to that as well. But again, we can add to this list uh, if you need to. Um, 7B uh, and 7C are kind of similar, but the impacts of racial profiling. Um, we were thinking on that section to actually have a very group of members of the community come in and talk about what their experiences have been. Uh, perhaps they're being pulled over directly by the police department as they have a, a racially motivated stop, for example. And then have the police department come in and give up their training of how they're, they're training their officers on uh, by police. And then section eight, I think I have a lot going on, sorry. Um, section eight is going to be an overview of internal affairs and how that, that complaint process works. So we're proposing having internal affairs uh, to get that presentation on because they know how they do the process. And, um, Modify what we have, but that's uh, probably the best piece of have that done. Section nine would be additional policies and procedures. This is a little bit of a all, but we have here the escalation, the duty to interview, volume on camera policy, and personal conduct. Um, we would propose possibly having Olga as a theater as a green map. And then uh, 10 is across how we do uh, our data. Now, these last two are, are a little bit open because once we have our bylaws formalized and voted upon, that will kind of direct what we're doing here. So, we're doing it a little bit open, but again, we'd be proposing that our staff would be doing this. And the very last one, um, 11, uh, that one's about witness reliability, standard legal concept, um, study. Chicago's uh, civilian officers police accountability. They actually have a training uh, that we think we might be able to, if not borrow, we could probably take and modify. Uh, and there's also a, um, I believe that link is can't see here. I believe that was also a uh, link. Um, the last one uh, is section 12, which is the process of decision making. Sharon Fairley is um, with the University of Chicago. We've actually had some conversations with her, and she was hired by. Uh, same for justice to do an audit of uh, her, uh, what works and what doesn't work. Um, she is a, a pretty good expert, but again, I was one person that, that might be able to help us with kind of the how you look at cases and, and make decisions based on that. So that was a high level. I know it's a lot to go over. Um, again, I think here is we're not going to vote to approve this. It's an open kind of discussion. So um, okay. you have an action item on here, but I would say it's really not action item. Um, not an action item for this um, on ad hoc training committee. We just put public comment in discussion. So you were looking at B, 7B. Um, all right, so do we have any public comment, Ms. Ogie? Yes, thank you. Uh, we'll start with our in person public comment. Um, Kate Given Duddy, you'll have 90 seconds. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Kate. I'm going to take up my time, right? Okay. No, no, no. It's, I haven't started. Okay, now that it is, you all know, and this is free. I'm not here representing any organization other than myself. I first want to say there's a terrific uh, piece of work that the training committee has done, and I'm very impressed by it. I have one uh, minor comment and one major comment. My minor comment is I would hope that you would also get outside criminal defense attorneys as part of the um, criminal law and procedure and all that. And of course, I can give you names that you already know me, you know, Eugene, Irondale, Al Glenn, and Chuck Bell, there's a whole bunch of people, I'm sure Mr. Bennett also knows people. But here's why I'm really here, and that is my objection, my very strong objection to using uh, ADL in any context. Um, the um, ADL holds themselves as an expert on hate crimes, but in fact, in my view, they are a hate organization. They were, um, they originated to fight anti-Semitism, but now their definition of anti-Semitism is any criticism of Israel, any support of Palestine, and of freedom and liberation for uh, Palestinians. 
They are unnaturally, they have been engaged in all kinds of campaigns to stop uh, the speech of people who support uh, freedom for Palestine. They have um, engaged in campaigns locally that I know of personally. They have been involved in trying to get uh, student organizations. Your time is not up to no, stopping. They've tried to get student organizations and professors to stop. And, but I, I do want to tell you about two local incidents in which I was personally involved in which ADL parties. Sorry, Kate, if you can forward the rest of the email, your time is up. No, I, I've got to finish Let this. Let it I've got to finish this because this is really important. Um, my husband is president of Corona, which is an organization um, the Arab world and the Muslim world. And they put on uh, the Arab Film Festival every year. They put on a joint program with the Asian Film Festival last month, showing a film here in Bethlehem Park. ABL organized a campaign, hundreds of phone calls and emails to MOPA that have been canceled because it was a Palestinian film. Uh, Peace Resource Center also had a program that was sponsored by uh, Jewish Voices of Peace about Palestine. Hundreds of emails and um, phone calls to get them to can cancel that. They do not want people to hear what's really going on. Their um, definition of anti Semitism, as I said, is uh, discriminatory. And I think that it would be a huge mistake for this organization to have them and now I'm getting I am uh, and, but I've given you some other resources that I sent in. There's also another one, anti-Semitism curriculum at gmail.org, which is an excellent curriculum of anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move on to our virtual attendee. Again, you have 90 seconds and we'll go with Layla O. Hi, um, my name is Lily. I started speaking earlier. I'm also a Jewish resident of San Diego living in District 9 and I'm also here to oppose in the strongest terms any training conducted that includes the ADL. The ADL is not a friend to the Jewish community or any of our communities. It is a group that sows hate and division posing as a civil rights organization. It has a long history of dividing our communities and making Jewish people less safe. One way it does this is by providing false and misleading data on anti-Semitism. While claiming to be the forefront organization combating anti-Semitism, it provides unverified reports and misleading statements to the media that ultimately serve to make Jewish people and all people less safe. It also does this by misdefining anti-Semitism by counting any instance of criticism of the state of Israel as anti-Semitic. And the ADL does not exempt Jewish people from this criticism as it extensively documents and targets any Jewish group or person that speaks out against Israel's crimes. The ADL makes anti-Zionist Jews uh, less safe and it makes and a recent newspaper article referred to the ADL as, quote, Israel's attack dog in the US, given its laser, laser sharp focus on silencing dissent against the state of Israel. This is not a group that combats anti Semitism. This is a hate group. Um, uh, as the speaker before me um, uh, indicated, there are many alternatives to the ADL. Um, and uh, a benefit of these alternatives is that they don't seek to divide the Jewish community. We'll move on to Kristen Kelly. Kristen, you may unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Um, yes, my, thank you. My, my name is Kristen. Thank you. My name is Kristen. I am a San Diego resident and member of Jew Jewish Voice for Peace. And I would just like to echo the previous sentiments about the concern of the participation of the Anti-Defamation League and any uh, activities uh, regarding this committee or uh, in San Diego in general. Um, I would struggling advocate for training on anti-Semitism anti that situates it within the larger framework of anti-racism and dignity and justice for all instead of through an organization like the ADL that actively promotes Islamophobia and plays a role in dividing communities, paving the way for racist hate crimes such as those that we have seen across uh, the Palestinian, Palestinian American communities across the past four months um, and across the country. 
Um, the ADL also promotes a state that is hyper-militarized and hyper-policed in Israel in order to maintain an apartheid state, which is based in racist values and which that we reject in our communities here. And the uh, Israeli state, which the ADL uh, works hard to promote as the previous speaker uh, illustrated, also uh, exports violent policing tactics and surveillance to police offices across the United States. And I am very concerned about their involvement uh, in our police departments here. Uh, and the ADL is also endorsing an active genocide in Palestine and an ongoing ethnic cleansing for the past 75 years, uh, which in addition to its years of racist divisism, automatically disqualifies the ADL from being a legitimate resource for fighting hate crimes. Thank you, Kristen. We'll move on to Richard Sachs. You may unmute, you have 30 Hello. seconds. Hello, my name is Richard Satz and I'm a Jewish resident of San Diego. I'm here today out of concern that this commission has invited the ADL to participate in trainings of our law enforcement on hate crimes, including anti-Semitism. As a Jewish person, I cannot endorse or support a training led by the ADL on hate crimes as I believe the ADL, a problematic group with racist practices that masquerades as a civil rights organization. In reality, the ADL actually makes Jewish people less safe in our communities. The ADL openly attacks Jewish folks who are critical of the Israeli government and engages in coordinated efforts to target any individual or group who uses their First Amendment right to criticize the government of Israel. The ADL seeks to conflate my Jewish identity with the policies and actions of the Israeli government, which under the ICAJ has been found to be genocidal and engaging in war crimes. I reject that my Jewish identity is in any way connected to the policies and crimes of a foreign government. I believe this stance by the ADL makes me more vulnerable to possible anti-Semitism. Additionally, the ADL is not a reliable source for data, and they have come under criticism for misrepresentation, providing false data, and reporting incidents without verifying them, compromising the, val the validity and integrity of their data, and which could also compromise our city's ability to be fully accountable to its community. As a Jewish person, I know anti-Semitism exists, but we do not need to be dishonest about the incidents and data in order for our communities to be protected. I ask this commission to work with a reliable and trustworthy organization like Parseo for trainings on anti-Semitism. I do not want my tax dollars to be wasted on an organization like the ADL. Much problematic. Thank you. We will move on to Sophie. You have 90 seconds. Yes, hi, my name is Sophie and I live in District 4. I'm a San Diego resident and I'm also a proud Jewish person. And I echo all of the speakers before that have voiced their concern for partnering with the ADL for this training. As a Jewish person, I fully support the liberation and freedom of Palestine and the way that the ADL has categorized support for Palestine and anything that is speaking out against Israel as hate crimes is completely wrong. I believe that in order for anyone to actually be free, everyone must be free. And we are taught from a very young age to always question authority. And I went to UC Santa Cruz where questioning authority was a very important piece of my education and being able to question where our tax dollars are going, where what our government is doing for us. And as Jews who do not support the state of Israel, it is critical that we are protected as well and that everybody is protected and that does not involve the ADL. So I hope that you all will decide to partner with a different organization as suggested by the other attendees at this meeting. Thank you, Sophie. We will now move on to Ethel. Um, you'll have 30 seconds to speak. You may unmute now. Ethel, you can un unmute now. Okay, can you hear me? I'm yes. Ethel. Okay, I'm Ethel Swede, 86 year old Jewish woman, La Jolla resident. The Commission on Police Practices should not invite the ADL to participate in a training session on hate crimes and anti Semitism. Our country prides itself on equal rights for all, written into our sacred governing documents. 
and fought for from the country's inception. Israel, on the other hand, is a country <laughs> built on de jour and de facto and out and out and in equality dedicated to Jewish supremacy. The ADL not only supports this inequality, but seeks to silence criticism of Israel by falsely labeling critics anti-Semitism. They are pushing for legislation, making such criticism a hate crime. My husband and I know a thing or two about discrimination. We live in La Jolla Shores, purchasing our home in 1982. We found the following racist language in the deed that no part of said tract shall at any time be lived upon by any person whose blood is not entirely that of the Caucasian race. In 1948, the Supreme Court struck down this language on the grounds it violated the equal protection of the 14th Amendment. UCSD founder Richard Ravel said you, can, you can't have a university without having Jewish professors. And- Okay. Any more speakers, Ms. Obi? This concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers, both in person and online. We appreciate your input. Now we'll have 10 minutes of uh, commissioner discussion. Uh, go ahead. Anybody have discussion? Okay, as a commissioner, I'm just saying, I think that some of them can be combined um, so that they can be, because some of them are, are relatively similar or maybe, you know, of the same topic. So that's just a thought. It is a really well thought out. Um, training and like you said we have um and i just thought that some might be able to be combined because they were similar uh that's all and i would like to see you know more outside people this is just my opinion outside people come in to um do some trainings and um that's it for me. anybody else commissioner benitez <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, of course, <clears throat> uh, as I was reading through this, I just want to clarify to her point about whether things can be combined, because there were a few things that were, were obviously going to take less time. And I assume that, you know, we would be putting sessions together where maybe multiple subcategories of these would be in the same training session, but it would be, you know, line item of that. So, um, by you nodding, I'm assuming that that's the case. Um, and I do agree that um, <clears throat> much as uh, we all love uh, Dwayne Bennett, that um, uh, that it would be helpful to hear from uh, other attorneys who work in this field. Um, they'll likely be saying the same thing, but it's, you know, I think that it's helpful for us to hear more voices um, uh, as we're uh, trained on, particularly on the legal issues. Um, but I want to say this is this obviously took a lot of time and energy and it's really well thought out the way that it goes from one thing to another makes a lot of sense and thank you so much and also once we get a lot of the business and the operating procedures in place and things like that we have more time at meetings to use part of the meeting to train which is what we need to get us up to speed but we have to continually do this because there's still more to, there will always be more for us to learn so um, that will hopefully be part of it too, so we don't have to, you know, plan extra different sessions because commissioners do not put their time. It's not, yeah, it's not connected. Hello, hello, there okay. we go. Uh, we're also gonna try to record all these, so not only can commissioners watch it, we don't have to start the whole thing from scratch, but also community members can watch them as well. We have Commissioner Aziz online. Um, can you please give her, uh, unmute her? Hi, thank you so much for this phenomenal work. I mean, um, it really, you can tell you guys really worked hard on this. One of the, um, comments or questions that I had is for the ride along. And I did hear you say 
Um, I don't know because it's in the bylaws as required what we'll be doing about that. One of my concerns is in order to do a ride along, you have to waive your rights of if anything happens to you, any liability to the police department. And I think that's kind of unfair. We're forced to do a ride along, but we're also forced to waive any liability if anything happens to us. And so I just wanna, you know, some of us have children and it's very important that if something happens to us, if we're forced to do something or we have to do it in order to continue our work as a commissioner, but yet we have no protections, I'm not okay with that. Second, I really would like us to look at um, the, um, the different trainers and make sure that um, when, we're, when we're bringing people in that no one um, is harmed by that. I don't feel comfortable with um, being trained by any individuals if it's based on a situation or circumstance or what their um, professional expertise is, if it's not across the board like that for everyone. So that was just, um, I wanna say that about any trainers, consultants, anyone we're bringing in, I think that's very, very important. Thank you. So I can try to answer the right along thing. So as commissioners, we're kind of in a weird uh, position because we're technically city employees, even though we are volunteers. So if, for example, we are going to ride along and have a car accident, we're covered by the city's workers' comp. So it's a little bit different than if you're just a normal average citizen that has to be ride along. Um, but I think going to your second point, you know, in the past, I think we had a requirement that you needed to do one ride along a year, I believe it was. I, the idea with the, the newer commission is we want to open it up to have a, a discussion for all this of what people want to do. I think some people want to do ride-alongs and other people have been very adamant that they don't want to do ride-alongs. So I think we need to, as a commission, discuss that. And if someone, for whatever reason, doesn't feel comfortable doing a ride-along and they don't want to, I mean, I think that's something, I mean, we can figure out whether the executive director or the cabinet basically excuses it if there's a requirement or if there's even a requirement. We haven't decided any of that yet. And then Doug has his hand up. I saw Alex. Hang on. Just one more thing. At this point, Commissioner Aziz, it's not a requirement. At this point, it's if you want to go, you go. Again, before it's if or when it's made a requirement, it would be a vote of the commission. So at this point, it's not a requirement, and that would be discussed here. Uh, I saw Commissioner Byer. I'm sorry. Commissioner. The draft bylaws do not have the right law requirement. Thank you. Commissioner Byer. I uh, took a ride on, since I've been a commissioner twice, uh, one in December with Northern Division and once last month with uh, Western Division. And uh, no, they didn't ask me to sign anything or waive anything. And uh, in addition, since we're commissioners, uh, we differ from uh, regular ride alongs in that we get to go to the briefings before each shift goes out. So I rode with second watch, which is the middle of the day from 2 p.m. to midnight, both times. And each time they got me there ahead of time. So I, I sat in while the uh, sergeant lieutenants uh, told all the officers on the shift what car they were in, where they're going to go, all that stuff. So we have special access. And, and in my experience, this last two rides, Layla, um, they didn't ask me to sign anything or, or wear a vest or do anything. Thank you, Commissioner Byer. We have a couple more minutes and we have Chief Investigator Golu and then Commissioner Larkin. And then Justice. Thank you. Okay, so I don't want to take too much time, but just also to add my five cents. Um, ride alongs are part of the recommended training um, program by NACO, which combines you know, best practices for multiple organizations like the CPP across the nation. So I would also strongly encourage commissioners to do right alongs. As an investigator, I did a couple of those myself, uh, and you really gain some useful insight that can definitely help you with case review. Thank you, Chief Investigator um, Golu. Commissioner Larkin. Um. A few years ago, a long, minimum of a few years ago, I did a ride along with Santa and it was very important for the commissioners that haven't done a ride along. It's, it's extremely useful. It's extremely useful. Um, I'd like to put forward that it be not required, very well encouraged by all of us. 
Um, it's something that we should be doing, but I don't see it being necessarily required for the review. I think that might run into other kind of problems. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Justice, and then Diaz, and then we need to wrap up. And then Commissioner Hart. So how long does a typical ride along last? Is it just, uh, three, four hours or um, they, they offer you, my experience was they offer you uh, the entire shift, but if you get tired in the middle, you don't know how to go back and take you back to the station. So it's it's entirely up to you as the commissioner riding along to determine how long you're going to ride with Thank you, Commissioner Diaz and then Harvey. Yeah, mine is related to number 5A, where it says for the mentally disturbed individual. I'd like to change that wordage from individual living with a mental illness or individual living with a mental health issue because that's what we use in medicine right now in the psychiatric community. They don't use disturbed because disturbed is a, an adjective which kind of throws it on the onus of the individual, like he's inherently disturbed, which we now know that it is um, brain dysfunction. Um, so I'd just like to change that because we have we live with a lot of stigma in our society for psychi psychiatric um, you know, illness. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Diaz. Commissioner Harvey. Yeah, and then I'm just going to ask a question. Don't need to be answered today. But for those individuals that have gone on ride alongs, I'd like to hear from them to see what they did gain from that. Um, what were the positive things that you gained from that? Number? I'd like to hear that. That that may help me with my opinion about it. Okay, uh, so Chair Hilbert, um, can we take some of these ideas? Do you want to re rework them by the next meeting, and then let's put in some time to talk about ride-alongs and um, what address what uh, Commissioner Harvey is recommending, pros and cons maybe, um, and then we can hopefully take a vote next time and maybe combine a couple of, and and again this is, will be a living document so do you have any closing comments <laughs> miss ob i just wanted to flag that commissioner Aziz had her hand up but put it down so i'm not sure if she's trying to speak i think i think she's okay she was um on the chat but thank you i'll just say i, I was taking as many notes as I could, as fast as I could. <laughs> um, but I think we have it recorded, so I can always go back. I, I've made a lot of notes. I will work with um, our co-chair on this. We'll make the edits. And what I'll probably try to do is uh, have both the onboarding and uh, the case review one brought back. So at hopefully that point, we... We already voted on the onboarding. Yeah, we did. It's not uh, so, yeah, well, uh, I won't be at the next meeting, uh, but I will let um, Darlene know and she can jump in there. Thank you so much, and thank you again to the Ad Hoc uh, Training Committee for this excellent job. Um, so on the Ad Hoc Operating Procedures Committee, Co-Chair Case, do you want to just update us? Yeah, would be very quick. Uh, we are working on the investigations procedure, and we're working off of the document that was initially prepared by uh, our legal counsel, Dwayne Bennett, and then uh, substantially modified and revised uh, by our chief investigator, Kolub. And uh, we are making our way through it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, detailed issues there. And so we spent a lot of time uh, at our meeting discussing a few issues, but we're going to work ourselves through that. Uh, we still have about two thirds of the document to, to go. Our next meeting is going to be on February the 28th. And my guess will be probably at least uh, two more meetings before we finish uh, that document. Uh, and. Uh, Likely, we will recommend taking that document, this one document, and forwarding that to the city council, and then taking the other uh, procedures that will require a meeting concurrence in that uh, in the subsequent uh, referral, so that uh, we can uh, expedite uh, the investigation procedures. Thank you, Co-Chair Case. All right, so committee. Good evening. Um, as the ad hoc uh, personnel committee presented a proposal to the city council of uh, the idea that you would be the responsible for the selection of the 
new executive director. However, uh, legal counsel has advised that this, according to our procedures, uh, would not be allowed that the city council will still be purview, had purview over that hiring. What they have done has been invited uh, the ad hoc personnel committee to sit with uh, uh, to city council persons, uh, Von Wilpert and Capillo, and develop the process of how the city council will move forward with this process. Uh, and we will be part of that uh, according to how the city council has legally been responsible for the uh, development of the hiring of the executive director. So we will be part of it, but we will not be the overseers of that process. Thank you. And thank you to all those commissioners who have taken part in the personnel committee. And at this point, they will all be part of the process, correct? Thank you. All right, so we're moving ahead to oh, one more thing. At this point, uh, we don't have a timeline. And so uh, our uh, interim executive director and I will be contacting the council to give us a timeline. When we meet again, we will have that timeline and let you know how we have proceeded. Thank you. All right, moving along to new business. This is a follow up from a couple of meetings ago or a previous meeting um, regarding how to show commissioner e or how or if to show commissioner emails on the website. And I want to thank staff who's been working on it. Um, Ms. Obed, who has a beautiful presentation to share with us. So um, I will move along to her once the presentation is over with public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as staff pulls up the presentation, um, I can give a little bit of the background. Um, on January 3rd, we were discussing commissioner emails and how we want to display it on our website. And one of the um, actions from that meeting was asking staff to look into different um, how to look into how different commissions and boards and oversight across the nation are doing this. So, wait, wait sorry, one second. Uh, we're having technical difficulties. Can you see me on your screens? Yeah, you might need to share. Can I just check in and make sure everybody can hear us? Hold on. Yeah, if you can hear us, please raise your hand um, just to help us figure that out online. So I'll continue, um, you all gave us the action of looking into different police oversight entities and how they do it. Um, my team and I looked into 20 different police oversight bodies across the nation and uh, presented you with uh, four different options uh, that, have dif uh, that do different things. So we'll go over that. Um, and then part of what I'm, we're gonna show you is what we have now on our commission page, what the San Diego City Council does, the different agencies across the nation and our recommendations. And you'll have time for questions at the end. So um, we talked a little bit about uh, the background, really the purpose of this presentation to answer the question about commissioner emails and how should we display them on our website, but also how should we handle responding to emails um, that are received by the commission. So this is what our current page looks like. We have the name of the uh, the commissioner. We have their title within the commission, within the commission, and we have their seat that they're elected in. 
Um, and if you are a committee chair, uh, we also have your title of the committee chair. And we include, of course, headshots as well as the bios once people click on the names. This is what the San Diego City Council does. They have the name, the title, the district, and they actually display the email directly. As well as their photo, of course. So the um, other oversight agencies that we're going to show, there's uh, four of them, if time permits, we'll go over all of them, if not, we'll skip. The first one is the Oakland Police Commission. And what the Oakland Police Commission has on their websites is the headshots, the titles of individuals, the emails, as well as the term. And then when you uh, go in, or uh, some of them also have the, the actual position that they were elected in. And when you click on email, um, it gives you, gives you the full email. Uh, they do not have biogra biographies on their um, commission pages. The New York Civilian Complaint Review Board has the titles, the names, the positions, and biographies, and they do not include the terms or emails. If you see the page, once you click on the commissioner or the, the, the person's name, it takes the page with their photo as well as their The Los Angeles Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission includes headshots and titles, um, as well as the names. Uh, but they do not include biographies, emails, terms, or positions. And the St. Louis Civilian Oversight Board um, includes the names, position, terms, but they do not include photos, bios, positions, districts, or emails. And when you click on the name here, it will take you to this page and it shows you um, the term as well as who it was, or they were appointed. This takes us to staff recommendation. Um, we recommend to add the word email under every commissioner's name and then to link email to both the commissioner's email, the CPP email specifically, as well as the Commission on Police Practices general email. And in this, um, in this approach, we address three concerns. One, the concern of capacity. If commissioners do not have the capacity to respond to their emails, staff can go in and respond on their behalf. We also address privacy. Some commissioners um, mentioned that privacy is a concern. So in this case, people don't get access to the email. Only if they click on it, it will take a, an option to email the commissioners. And then it also um, addresses spamming. So this doesn't make it easy for people to get everyone's emails, therefore sending the same email to all the commissioners over and over again. We also recommend in regards to how to respond to emails, we recommend that commissioners reply to their emails directly, to emails directly sent to them if the email is specific to the commissioner's role and experience. Um, and we have, if the commissioner does not reply within five days, staff will automatically respond to those emails. There's a few exceptions for when commissioners should not apply or reply to their emails, and those are the following. Media inquiries, official representation or presentation, presentation training requests, as well as OCPP business. And in those cases, staff will directly um, reply or staff will direct to um, entities that, are, that should take lead on those responses. And one note is staff will always CC the interim executive director as well as the commissioner who received the original email in all of their responses. And we're also asking that commissioners CC the general CPP email once if they reply in order to let us know that, hey, we've replied and handled this email, you do not have to reply. 
With that being said, this concludes my presentation. Prior to questions, we need to see if there's public comment. Thank you, that was an excellent presentation. Do we have any public comment on this commissioner email prior to discussion? I have no in-person public comment on this item. If you are joining us virtually and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand now. I have, oh, never mind. Yes, I have Evie. Um, Evie, uh, you may speak. You have uh, 90 seconds or not. I'm going to unmute you, you, Evie. You may unmute if you'd like to speak on this agenda item. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to admit that I'm having a very hard time understanding many of the people on mics. The clearest people were the ones that spoke uh, on the um, issue about uh, the Jewish of, of Voices for Peace group. So I don't know if your uh, mics are very different, but that one was very clear. Um, also, I'm not sure when I hit the lower hand, is my hand up? And if I hit, or is it, is it down? Right now, your hand is up, so when you click raise hand, hand is up. Okay, I want to speak on the one about the uh, executive director, not this, but thank you. Okay. Thank you, Evie. This concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. I just have a note from our, um, I see Commissioner Benitez, from our outside council, and he says, obviously, commissioners should not respond to public email regarding complaints and investigative concerns. So let's note that from our outside counsel, Mr. Bennett. All right, so I have uh, Commissioner Benitez. Just a technical question. So um, the the BCC or the CC automatically has to remember to do that. If we receive an email and we respond, we're gonna have to remember to CC the generic email, is that correct? You will reply. Right, but we'll have to remember to do it. There's no way to make it so that that happens. And then the other thing is, um, there's, you didn't address, I can, I see you were focused on emails and you were talking about privacy and spamming, not putting our actual email up there, but our bios are up there. Was there a recommendation about leaving the bios up? And before you answer, um, uh, if someone were to click on email, would it be one of those things where their email server pops up and email and it gets sent to us automatically? You know what I mean? Like, right? So if you click on email, it's going to bring up Outlook depending on who the person is or uh, Gmail or whatever, correct? Yeah. And about the bios. So, yes, in regards to your second question, the bios was not something that was uh, brought up during the last conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Larkin. I didn't see anything in this on um, the subject line, Mr. Trump. and I think it's really important for the emails that we get that are coming to us have something in it that says this is CPP. I mean, even starting with the subject line of CPP, when it comes into my, my, my box, then I know that it's from you guys, you know, or from another commissioner, or make up anything that you want, but there needs to be some sort of a uniform that are uniform, I guess, code, if we want to call it that. But that discipline, you know, some of us get a couple hundred emails, well, a hundred emails a day, okay? I'd really like to know that that's from you. But do you get a hundred emails to your city email? These are you're talking about, no, no, I okay, don't. that's the city yeah. email. Okay. So this is your personal email will never be connected to this email. This is only connecting the city email address that you have, like mine is Trangy. Okay, erase that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have an odd question that I want to bring up. What if someone wants to email a commissioner without the CPP? I, I guess I kind of have a little concern copying the CPP on all my emails, quite frankly. Um, uh, outside attorney Bennett, last time addressed that all commissioner emails are public uh, open. That was I understand that they're always public, and I think um, Mr. Bennett wants to say something. I, I, I know that, and I know any email that I send can be splashed on the front page of the UT. So my work email is the same way because I work for a public entity. But if someone wants to email me privately, I have a problem with going to the 
staff as well. Uh, Mr. Bennett. Yes, commissioners, uh, good evening. Yeah, that's going to be an issue. Uh, if somebody emails you privately and it's totally unrelated to CPP business, that's perfectly fine. But if they email you and it's a CPP matter, it does become a public record. The, the caution that I would give any commissioner, and I'm, thank you so much, Chair, for that clarification that this would only involve or uh, email would only be directed to city email. The concern would be that if a commissioner started using their private email to transact public business, they are now inviting the public into their private computer, and that would not be a suggested approach. So, so any 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 official communication relative to the CPP and a commissioner becomes public record and becomes something that the, that the commission somehow needs to retain as a public record uh, under the ordinance and under its obligations under the P Public Records Act. Mr. Bennett, Commissioner Benitez. Before we go anywhere with this, I'm sorry, I'm, I have to jump in. I have to leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us as much as you can. Your voice is very important. Thank you, Commissioner Larkin. Commissioner Benitez. So to your point, this is only for when this tool, the automatic built in CC to the office is only when people are clicking on it on the website. It doesn't mean that if I email you at your city email, it's only going to go to you. This is only emails that come in through the website when someone clicks on that. So it's going to be an outsider that's going to say, oh, I want to I want to email Chair Tran. And it is likely someone who's not known to you because they're going to the website to get this email. So that's, that's a very helpful clarification. That's a very helpful clarification. I thought all emails were copied because most of my emails for Janelle is copied on, excuse me, Dr. Scarborough is copied on. But um, okay, that's very helpful. Uh, we do need to move along. Is there any more discussion? I, I personally like the way that email says email rather than trying to or whatever. I'm just using mine as an example. Um, I think it's cleaner. And I, I, I'm okay with the CPP going to the CPP. Um, anyway, does someone want to make a motion on, on that? Okay. I'll make a motion to approve. Sorry, to approve the staff's recommendations on uh, email usage on our website. Okay, that Commissioner Benitez seconds. I want to clarify that it will remain email with your email hidden. This is city email only this is not a personal email and it will go to the cpp um as well staff and what is that email address cpp at cme.gov oh that's long um <laughs> hold on sorry um yes commissioner benita there we're we have a motion but we have to discuss no uh uh just just to be clear um on this motion it also includes the recommendations being made about those kinds of things as well. Right. Thank you. Um, who specifically gets those emails? Because we're still in discussion there. Uh, uh oh. All right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Okay, we have one abstention with Commissioner Byer. Commissioner Justice, did you vote? For, okay, thank you. I didn't see your hand. All right, thank you all again. And, and again, staff, this is an excellent um, summary. Thank you for your time on this. All right, moving forward. Um, sorry, are we including Layla? I'm so sorry. Layla, yes. her vote. I was a yes. I apologize, Commissioner Aziz. No, you're you. fine. You're are fine. You I'm on a television screen. You're fine. Thank I'm you. All right, I have an item. Uh, 8B, since it's irrelevant um, and we had resignations rather than voting out any um, commissioners for unexcused absences. So we're moving on to review of expired cases. I do want to note that there was a mistake as far as the vote to forward the decision to city council. That is not needed, but we will take an action item to vote on um, what we're going to, the themes outlined by the outside investigator. Chief Investigator Golu. Hello, thank 
future trans. So this is an update regarding um, getting on board the contract investigator to review the expired cases as was voted by the commission earlier. Um, so the good news is that OPOA related concerns that were about the investigator's contract have been resolved. So now the uh, next steps are to actually finalize the investigator's contract, which includes scoping it. So to do that, uh, this past Saturday, the cabinet, um, interim executive director Scarborough, site council Bennett, and myself met with the contract investigator to discuss um, the trends he could potentially look into and to scope his work further. And we provided some input to the cabinet and interim executive director, and they're working on finalizing that scope. Um, just to provide you a few um, kind of more information about the scope and what the work will entail, the investigator will take a look both at expired category one and category two cases. Um, he will do kind of a cursory, not a cursory, he will do um, a review of some general trends like demographics, um, divisions where incidents took place, um, types of allegations, so those sort of um, kind of statistics. And then he will do a deeper dive into some select substantive issues like um, thoroughness or timeliness of IA investigations, BWC policy compliance, and some other trends. Um, he will not be looking at, into individual cases. He will not be giving recommendations on individual cases. He will not be focusing on actions of individual officers. It's more of a audit or review kind of, of cases as a whole. And the idea is that um, it will be a high level overview, but detailed enough to allow the commission to elicit some substantive data based on the trends that he will identify. So um, just again to reiterate, Interim Executive Director Scarborough is working on finalizing the scope and actually working with the city on initiating the contract. And I will be working with IA to um, ensure that the investigator has access to those expired cases. Um, that's really all. And let us know if you have any questions on this. Do we have any public comment, Ms. Obi? I have no in-person public comment. If you are joining us virtually and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand now. Again, if you're joining us virtually and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand now. This concludes public comment for this item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Obi. Discussion on this. Any input that you would like to add? It's, we're going to make it a, as um, deep as possible within the budgetary guidelines and and also we don't want it to take a year so that's another issue that um so and he understands uh what our goals are as far as to have a report you know within a decent time frame he'll give us that information as he starts to delve into it um the, the only action item is just a consensus on moving forward if there are any problems, do we have a consensus on moving forward? Are there any other input? If we have a consensus, we do not need to vote. Okay, looks like a consensus. Thank you. Um, I'm going to suggest we take maybe a five minute break and um, then we will go into closed session. Uh, Mr. Bennett, do you want to go ahead and lead us into closed session? Sure, sure. I can do it right now and then you all can uh, take a break. There'll be a recommended closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54957 to discuss cases that are deemed confidential under Penal Code Sections 832.5 through 832.8 and Evidence Code Section 1040. That would be the recommendation. We need to take public comment. Is there public comment for I have no, I have no in-person public comment on closed session. If you are joining us virtually to speak on closed session, please raise your hand now. Again, if you're joining us virtually to speak on public on closed session, please raise your hand now. This concludes public comment for this section. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will go into closed session. Let's take a five-minute break, um, and then we'll go into closed session. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Azizan. We would be coming back by about 6.50. Okay, That's see you.
time, 6.50. Six, six, for you, will be coming back in five minutes, and as well as outside counsel, Mr. Bennett, for closed session. Do we need to log in on the other login yes. Zoom or no? Yes. yes, there's a separate link for it. Yes, there's a separate link for it, Commissioner Aziz. Got it. And what time did you say? Uh, let's say six o'clock. Okay, see you then. Bye. We'll see you at six o'clock while everyone takes a little break and stretches their legs. Thank you. An open session now with the Commission on Police Practices. After a closed session, I turn to our outside counsel, Mr. Dwayne Bennett. Mr. Bennett? Thank you, Honorable Chair. The Commission met in closed session pursuant to Penal Code Sections 832.7. Uh, or 832.5 through 832.7 to discuss matters deemed confidential, or excuse me, the commission actually met in, in closed session pursuant to government code section 54957 to discuss matters deemed confidential under penal code sections 832.5 through 832.8. The commission gave direction. There is no re reportable action that will conclude my report. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Do we have any um, quick commissioner comments? Anything anyone wants to share? Commissioner Byer. Uh, can we confirm the calendar for the upcoming meetings? The next meeting, the 21st, and after that, the March 6th and March 20th, are they all accurate? That is accurate, yes. If need be, we would add a Saturday for a form, but we would let you know part of it. We have February 20, excuse me, February 21st. That's a week, two weeks from tonight, March 6th, March 20th. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Any other? Commissioner Justice. Uh, thing I wanted to bring up uh, regarding uh, our chief investigator, uh, Ms. Oka. Uh, she completed an important uh, procedure yesterday uh, in completing another trip around the sun. So, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. She kept it 